Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey all, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's episode is a coaching episode with Sophie. This this episode is pretty near and dear to my heart because Sophie is actually a client of mine. She and I started working together over six years ago. We haven't worked together too much lately because she's doing really well, as you'll hear, but we started working together when her son Peter was three and, and things were really, really, really hard. She was really, really struggling. She's felt like she was failing as a mom and life, life was just falling apart. Peter's now nine and they have really done so amazingly. Sophie has done so well. So you'll hear some about her journey and I'm just so proud of her and I'm so happy to share this with you, this part of her journey. And you'll also hear that she still struggles with some things, namely, well, you know what? I'm going to wait and let you hear what she still struggles with because I think a lot of you will be able to relate. Of course, as always, we will check in with Sophie after the first part of our coaching to see how things went for her. I'm really excited for you to hear what's possible when you work as hard as Sophie did, when you really, you might feel like you're really down right now with things with your, with your child or your children, but it really is possible to make huge transformations. And, you know, maybe you don't need a coach or maybe you do, maybe you'll listen to this and you'll think, boy, I would really like to have that level of support. If coaching sounds like something that you would be interested in doing, I I have some availability right now for new clients and also Corey and Stoney who work with me, we all have a little bit of availability. So if coaching sounds like something that you might be interested in, you can go to sararosensweet.com slash parent hyphen coaching. I know it's not the best, it's not the best URL. You can also just get there by just going to sararosensweet.com and, and looking under parent coaches. So sararosensweet.com slash parent hyphen coaching to find out more about coaching. You can sign up there for a free short consult just to see if we click and to see how I can help you. So please reach out if this is something that resonates for you. If you have been a regular listener or maybe you're just a new listener, and you hear what it's all about, the coaching thing, I would love to hear from you. So let's meet Sophie. And again, Sophie, if you're listening, I'm so proud of you and what you have been able to achieve. I know how much work it was, and I'm just so glad that I have been able to be on this journey with you. Hi, Sophie. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, I'm so pleased to be on here. This is a little bit of a different coaching podcast because I already know you because we've worked together not too recently, but we did work together pretty intensively for a couple of years. Is that right? Yeah, you changed my life. Absolutely. Oh, oh, thanks. You're like, not going to make me cry on the podcast. I'm already crying. I'm already crying. (laughs) I don't cry a lot, but. Okay, so tell us a little bit about, about who you are and maybe just include how long, like when we started working together. Yeah. So we started working together when Peter was almost three. Well, I, my name's Sophie. I run a retreat center on 145 acres here in a little bit south of Denver, Colorado. I'm also an artist and a mom and I lead women's retreats. And yeah, that's pretty much about me. My son, Peter is almost nine now. I really found Sarah. I was separating with Peter's dad, my co-parent now, and things were really, really difficult. My, I grew up without, I, I really didn't know where to turn because, you know, growing up, my dad had been an alcoholic. My mom was super, super depressed and 
you know, kind of had just big mood swings that were, you know, scared me and were made it like, okay, definitely don't want a parent like that. And, and so I was working on my own anger from separating with my partner and all the, all that it was bringing up and feeling so alone. And I found Dr. Laura Markham's book, Peaceful Parenting, Stop Yelling, Start Connecting. And I just went to the website on there and just was like, where's, where's someone like, okay, you're going to have a parenting coach. Cool. Cool. Okay. And <laughs> interviewed another person they recommended and then had, you know, a little interest session with Sarah. And I was just like, I mean, I was bawling. I, I was at rock bottom as a parent. I think I had just like spanked my two-year-old and I just, I just was like, this is not the way, like, what is this? Who am I? What is going on? And how can I get some support? And so, yeah. So enter Sarah, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, I guided you, but you did all the work. Yeah, yeah. So like it, 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 you know, team effort a hundred percent, but mostly on you and you just needed, you needed support because you were just, you were going through a really hard time and you didn't, you had like your childhood baggage and Peter's not an easy kid either. He's one of our more complex kids, right? Yeah. I think I found the book too, also through the spirited child book that I, I read that also and was like, oh, he's got eight out of eight of these characteristics like okay the the whole approach that I'm taking towards this which I had attempted to take like an, an attachment parenting style but if you google what I did wrong with attachment parenting that that I pretty much did all of those things like I it was like I misunderstood how to actually take my child's cues and anyway so, we, say we more about that because I think that's really interesting I've I have thought over the years that a lot of people misunderstand attachment parenting but I've never heard anyone say that before like what yeah. what do you feel like you misunderstood about it I think uh, what it came to me was like, okay, I'm going to like breastfeed on demand and I'm going to do these things. But instead of actually reading my son's cues, it was, and also with my co-parent too, it was like, okay, we'll just keep him from being sad. And Mm. so he, he just was stuffing his little baby emotions. We also had a unique situation in that we were, we were living with you know, we were kind of like Bruce was like the, you know, live in supporter caretaker of like a more affluent person's space. So I think we were extra sensitive to the way Peter's behavior could affect the environment. Like you could see you don't, you don't want to disturb yeah. people kind of thing. Yeah. yeah that yeah. kind of thing, yeah. which persisted for, for a while until I actually left. But yeah, with the attachment parenting, it was like, I, instead of just spending the time to get to know my baby and understand the cues, I was just like doing all the things the attachment parenting said, like the baby wearing the skin, skin, just like all these things instead of actually, you know, really trusting, you know, being more baby led or those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Like, he's doing this, so that might mean that. That's super interesting because I think, I mean, because I, you know, somebody, when when I was pregnant, someone gave me the baby book, the Sears, you know, the, the Bible, mm-hmm. like the attachment parenting Bible. I mean, that was more than, it was like almost 24 years ago now, right? And I had never heard of attachment parenting, but I was like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. And, you know, I I definitely followed, followed that as well. And with my third child who was colicky, uh, she cried and cried and cried. And no matter what I did, like I, I had this goal of like, I've got to get her to stop crying. And I think I picked that up from attachment parenting, right? Like you're kind of, they kind of say, oh, if you do all of these things, your, your child will be so happy and they won't cry. Right. (laughs) But I wish I could go back and also wish I could tell other people, babies need to cry. Like they need to cry because that's how they release stress. And if you've done all of the things and you think, okay, they're, you know, they're dry and they're fed and they're burped and, you know, they don't have like a, a hair wrapped around their toe on inside the, the sleeper or whatever it is, and they're still crying. It's because they need to offload some stress. And there's a, such a thing as called crying in arms, which is like basically like you're holding your baby and they're crying because they need to like offload the stress. And so I think that is one of the things that is often mis- is often misunderstood. You're not alone. Is my very long winded of saying a way of saying you're not alone that you took away from that, that he should never cry because that's what I took away also. And, you know, I think that's, I think that the message needs to get out there for parents of infants and small children, like they do need to cry and it's okay if they cry, right? We're going to do all we reasonably can to make sure all their needs are met. But then after that, some babies just need to cry more than others. And so I I thought that was interesting. And I can see how knowing you and Peter, as I do, you know, some of his challenges led were from him not being able to express his negative emotions in a healthy way, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, his dad really just, if Peter was crying, it was like, he just, he couldn't handle it at all. He, I mean, it was, you know, yeah, he would just go into like panic mode and just do like everything he could to entertain Peter. Like, here's a little stuffy here, uh, throw him in the air, like just whatever he could do till Peter just, you know, honestly, I think he would just like conk out eventually. But babies do get overstimulated and they do fall asleep as a reflex to uh, risk a response to overstimulation. So that makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. And he, he was colicky. He was, I mean, my sister who also works with Sarah has four kids and Adair will even reflect still, you know, her, her youngest is two, that Peter was like on a whole nother level of just extreme. He just had so many feelings and nowhere to put them. And I think it had been backlog. Like when I worked with Sarah, she talked about unloading his emotional backpack. And that was really my mission. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, Peter was so bad that I had to basically quit my job and just stay home with him every day and just <laughs> work with him and and hold space for him to emote because he couldn't be alone or he would go totally, totally berserk and either hurt himself or something. But if he was me, he would, you know, he would just grab my clothes. and I mean, it was just, he was crying for like eight hours a day mm-hmm. and I'm not exaggerating. It was, it was really. Yeah. That was, was when you, lot. when we started working together. Yeah. And then I, I, you know, you, once you're hearing your child crying for that long, you, you start to like, you know, you start to break down inside yourself yeah. and just lose, like lose everything. You just start to go a little crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, because we're, we're designed to respond to our child's cries as if there is an emergency, right? So it takes a lot of working on our own nervous system response. If we do have a child that's crying and we have done everything that we can, and we're just focusing on welcoming the feelings because when you think about it, that doesn't start with toddlers. Like everyone who follows peaceful parenting knows welcoming feelings is a big part of that. But it has to start from the beginning, not just when they're older. Yeah. So there was a lot of work to kind of undo and really reparenting myself through the process. I think that was something with Sarah, like you, you gave me, you know, some guidelines and instructions. We also just held space for me to break down when I was at the end of my ability and self-regulation was one of the number one things for me to get because things felt so hard and I was working on separating and you know there was also someone in Peter's life who Peter felt safer around than around me his uncle Jeffrey and so there was also this you know additional curveball of what what Sarah called taking the lead like retaking the lead Mm -hmm. and having Peter you know, repatterning trust and safety with his own mom. And so instead of just, you know, this, you know, friend of the family. And so that was also just like another unique twist of, you know, the subtle things that I needed to do in order to like, like not really worry about Peter doing this or that or that, but really just focusing on being a safe place for him. Yeah. Yeah. And being that, yeah, being a strong leader for sure. You said something else that, oh, just about the work for yourself. I mean, that's, I don't know, I guess it's not a secret if I'm about to say it on a podcast, but that's kind of the secret of parent coaching is that like I become your parent in a certain way, like hopefully not in a weird way, but like I hold space for you. Like I'm trying to teach you to hold the space for your child, right? Like I'm welcoming your feelings. I'm loving you unconditionally. I'm doing all the things for you that you're learning how to do with your child. I remember one of the biggest things you said was it's not your fault. Like Mm -hmm. Peter's, Peter's this way. We don't, we don't know this or that or that, but this isn't your fault. Like Mm -hmm. he came in the way that he came in and he has these big feelings. And, and I think I had really, really, especially because I tried so hard with the attachment parenting and, you know, three years down the line, Googled how I did attachment parenting wrong and then saw every single thing. And I was like, oh, wow, this is (laughs) Kid, I, okay, this is, I learned so much. Like I, I would joke to young parents to be like, "Oh, call me if you want to know what not to do." <laughs> <laughs> well, just back on that, you didn't do. The, it's not your fault. I mean, I think that I was just talking to a mom this morning who has like a probably sensory seeking, really, really spirited toddler, and she just struggles to get through the day. And she was just feeling like she must be doing something. And it's like, no, no. Like in fact. You're, you sounds like you're doing a great job just because he, you're struggling. It doesn't mean you're doing the wrong thing. I mean, you know, we just had the summit a couple of months ago. We just had the summit all around these kids w- who are more complex, right? And yeah. so, and the reason why we had it is because there's so many parents with complex kids who think that they're doing something wrong or or they or things would be easier. And that's just so not true. I was really internalizing that blame and then projecting it on Peter. Mm-hmm. And it was like, 
I'm a failure because you won't do this. Yeah. You know, we're, we're having a hard time instead of just really, you know, once you allowed me the space to kind of like breathe through that and surrender that it was like, okay, now we, I can accept what is, and then I can, I can support, you know, actually see what Peter's doing. Yeah. And, and we like, did, I remember we did a lot of work around one of the main big ideas around, of peaceful parenting was he's doing the best he can and you're doing yeah. the best you can, right? Like he's yeah. doing the best he can. He wants to be good. He doesn't want to be, I always say, you know, kids don't want to be jerks. Like they really don't want to be, even if they're being provocative, it's because there's some other need that they're trying to get met that they don't know how to get met. Yeah. I remember another thing that once I had moved to Colorado and moved moved away from New York and was kind of, you know, single mom then with with a five-year-old. And, you know, I was, I was living in a, in a work, living at the retreat center in the work environment. And um, I had a bunch of like young single adults around who, you know, thought parenting was sort of more patriarchal version of parenting and things and wanted me to discipline him and all that. But there was so many unique ways that I was parenting because of Peter's situation. But I was, I was going through the motions like, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry you feel that way, but you know, like really empathy, but just saying the words and you called me out on it. You were like, yeah, but th- you don't really feel that way. So why are you even saying that? And I yeah. was like, oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm just saying the words. I'm not really feeling that he's actually upset. And it just felt like empathy was such the key to set him free and to set myself free from the frustration and just oh, actually sit with, wow, that. this child's really upset about this. He really cares about the pencil or the, you know, being, you know, whatever it is. And if I can really like feel that then I can help him, you know, actually express the feelings and hold space for that instead of just, okay, I said the thing, like, why isn't he changing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, why isn't it working? Quote, working. Really That's what people are like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. So that was another layer of the onion for you to sort of peel back of getting to the and empathy with, piece. I say, as far as like unloading Peter's emotional backpack, I, I tell people that Peter taught me how to love, mm. how to just, how to really hold space for someone who is in a lot of pain Mm -hmm. and just be there and not try to fix it, not try to say it's, or, I mean, I say it's, it's okay. It's all right, but not, not put a bandaid on it, you know, just be with it and Mm -hmm. just, just hold it and know that if I'm steady and I can regulate his nervous system by regulating mine. And that was, yeah, that was huge. I mean, I honestly believe that my son it just changed the whole trajectory of his life and his mental stability and all those things by being able to really focus on that. And instead of running away from it, just lean into it further until he had cried as much as he needed to cry or screamed as much as he needed to scream and unloaded that backpack. Sophie is like, you come from a line of sensitive people. I mean, you know, most addicts become addicts because they're sensitive and they don't know how to deal with their emotions. It sounds like your mom also had some emotional you know, she was de- probably depressed because she didn't didn't know how to. I'm not saying this is the only reason people get depressed or become alcoholics, but sensitivity and not being raised with help with somebody who helps you with your emotions. Often we 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 adapt like well, what do they call it? Maladaptive strategies to deal yeah. with it, right? To deal with our sensitivity. And, and so my dad called me sensitive Soph. That oh, was my name. Oh. And I would they would just lock me in my room and I would just scream until I turned blue and passed out actually because they didn't know how to deal with me. Yeah. So I growing up, you know, I I'm now 13 years sober, but I was headed straight towards addiction and abuse. You know, I mean, I mm-hmm. really, you know, had to had to clean up a lot. And having Peter really helped me continue that till now. I'm I'm. I'm so even keeled. I mean, I well, get a lot what you did though was break that that generational cycle, right? Yeah, yeah. Because if you hadn't done the work that you've done, you would have continued on with that. You know, I don't, I don't know if you would have necessarily, but like yeah. you did the work of teaching him how to live in the world as a sensitive person instead mm-hmm. of trying to shut it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And he was, he was sensitive to light. He was sensitive. I mean, he was sensitive to people, to everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> made made me think about my own childhood and. And I referenced recently in the group call, you know, you, I mean, just saying, you know, in those moments of feeling so alone, like, you know, your own mother is, you know, is human, but there's, there's a divine mother or there, you know, how, how can you have, find some comfort, you know, mm-hmm. and source it from within and, and with whatever spirituality you believe in. But, you know, it was like, I, I would literally just have to 
breathe and wrap myself in angel wings. <laughs> mm-hmm. And Sarah kind of led me through that. So I would use that during times where you just get so hung up on some little dumb thing, right? Just trying to get through the day. But if you can just pause and breathe and find that calm and surrender and then re-enter the situation. So that was really helpful for me too. I love that. To wow. Myself. I'm yeah. I I'm super proud of you <laughs> and all the work that you've done. Like, wow. This really yeah. It's nice to have this moment to be able to sort of look back on this with you. Yeah, you really. So tell us about Peter now, because I, you know, you and I haven't, we haven't worked together in a long time, but I have had little moments of connection with you from the membership. But so give us just a little, and we're going to, I know you do have some challenges. We are going to get to those, but just give us a little snapshot of how things are with Peter now. Peter is an amazing kid. I mean, just, we just had Thanksgiving with 41 family members, you know, 16 kids, 13 and under. And Peter was one of the only kids who took time to play with every every kid, no matter their age. I mean, parents were reflecting that to me, where he would just go have a moment or, tr- or entertain them or be a part of it. People reflected back to me, wow, he was the only kid who didn't lose their sh- <laughs> during, <laughs> you know, all week and um, even some of the older kids. And I, you know, or if he had a thing, he would just come up to me and be like, and then I'd be like, oh, why don't we go, you know, have some special time with just you and me or just, you know, get out of this over sensory. He's not Mm -hmm. used to having so many kids and so many people around. (laughs) And yeah, I mean, I'm just so proud of my kid. He's just, he's funny. He's polite. He's like, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed, Sarah. It's, it's incredible. It's so it's so cool. I'm so proud of him. I just love him. I have a big grin on my face for people who can't see me. And you've you've also been able to, on some of those calls in the membership where people are talking about their five-year-olds or that seems to be the, like an inflection point, like the five-year-old, you know, five and six. (laughs) And, and I love how you've been able to support other members like, oh yeah, I've totally been there and don't worry. They do get easier as they get older. (laughs) They yeah, out and of when it. Peter was five, I joined a call then, and there was it happened to be all it was like seven fi- moms of five year olds. It was, <laughs> and they just shared some stories, and it just made me realize, like, oh, my kid's totally normal. I just don't have any kids around me, and I don't know what's normal, and I'm uh-huh. making him wrong for all of this, and and all these other adults are getting so judgy, and he's actually totally cool. Like this is fine. I can I can relax. Like, well, you yeah. probably have. You know, you were talking about the other young people around you, like at your retreat center, and and you've probably had some influence on them too, in terms of like parenting and kids and stuff that they're going to go away and think about hopefully, and maybe consider doing peaceful parenting when they have kids if they have kids. Absolutely. I mean, I remember writing this Slack message that just, you know, set my boundaries down really and just outlined everyone what what my philosophy was, why I was doing it, you know, also I'm working with a professional <laughs> just just to get everyone kind of off my back and off Peter's too, to be like, mm-hmm. this, this is how we're choosing to do it. And there's intention behind it. And I know it doesn't make sense to you that I'm not sending my poor five-year-old who just moved across the country and is stuck with 12 adults during COVID <laughs> for 10 weeks, you know, into a room by himself. We just, you know, we don't, we, we don't, don't do we, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's awesome. So give us, so I know you, there was, there was something that you wanted to work on. This is actually going to be a coaching call. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm stoked. So I have supported Peter in a lot of, in some ways I feel like my mom was a very distant mom. You know, I mean, we had to like beg her to get out of bed. I don't have any memories of playing with her, you know, whereas I, I play with my son. We have some art things that we do together. Like we, we make up Pokemon cars and draw them and laminate them and stuff. But I'm, I am finding that getting Peter to like stay on task or like get out the door or, you know, get his, you know, the four things we need to do before we go to bed. And instead of me like commanding it or telling him, him just starting to get, you know, on rhythm of these healthy habits that feel like if we can get them in now, he's going to just have an easier time long term. Because I feel like for me, my parents didn't really help us get any healthy habits necessarily, or, or some I'm sure, but you know, just certain things like brushing your teeth where it takes more willpower for me versus like, this is just what I do. And I, you know, I, I value sleep. So I put myself to sleep. And yeah, so I think that's kind of the the overall basis. I can't life. remember if we said this on the call already, but he, if, if we, you said it before we started, but he's almost nine. I just want to make sure we get that. Yeah, right. I think here nine. too, like, I remember on our calls, you would be like, well, four is really about, you know, they're starting to learn that they know something different than you know. And mm-hmm. so there's 
you know, show me your teeth and if yeah. you brush versus did you brush your teeth? Like little things. I mean, like I think that, that still applies at nine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the wishful thinking yeah. thing, like anything that they, yeah. you know, I did you brush your teeth? Yes, I wish I brushed my teeth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that still still applies. But so to well tell me about you mentioned, you know, getting out the door in the morning and that there was things that you wanted him to be independent on that you still feel like you're supporting him on. So maybe just give me a snapshot of that and what that looks like. Yeah. Like, you know, where's your backpack? Where do you have shoes on? You know, like, did you, pa- did you pack a snack? Like we just have a closet with all the snacks. He can get, you know, what he wants and he brings to school. So, you know, or just, he goes to Montessori school, you know, is it, is it Friday? Where's your homework? Just, you know, little things where he just, you know, it's like, okay, go get your shoes on. And then I come into his room and he's doing a Rubik's cube or he's, you know, sitting on the floor, just, you know, doing a scratch off or doing Mm -hmm. whatever. And I'm like, all right, what about the shoes? And it, but it's, it's not that it's one or two times. It's that it's like 10 or 12 times right? um, of like, eventually you're like, dude, where are your shoes? <laughs> or like, here they are. Put them on your feet. Da, da, da. I'm like helicoptering. And I right. just feel myself feeling resentment and feeling like, why is this so hard? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, je- probably, I mean, there's a couple things that come into it. Probably he would rather stay home than go to school, right? He'd rather yeah. stay home and do his Rubik's Cube than go to school, even if he likes school. You know, there's just that like home is nice. I'm enjoying what I'm doing now and I'm not motivated. So that's still pretty, you know, pretty natural for all kids. And I also, I know you and I have talked about this before. So it's more than just the last two minutes of what you've talked about that still, I still wonder if he might have ADHD. All those things that you just listed are so, and of, and of course, like for anyone listening, I haven't met Peter and obviously I cannot And even if I have met him, I am not a person who's able to do an assessment or diagnosis. Like that's not my wheelhouse. However, I've worked with enough parents and I have two kids with ADHD and ADHD myself. And so I kind of can like recognize ADHD and what you just described really sounds like ADHD. That sort of the ADHD focuses on to do while he wants to get out the door. He's like, oh, oh, it's like, he's not like, no, I want to do my room scoop. He's just like, oh, where am I? Or I, he, it's like, he doesn't know how he got where he is. Right. Almost. The ADHD brain yeah. focuses on what's interesting, not what's important. So yeah. in that moment, what's interesting is his Rubik's cube, not his shoes. Yeah. not getting his shoes on. Right. And, you know, I'm not, I, and you, I think you told me before that he does, that he does well in school. His teachers don't have concerns or, or I, I ask, I'll ask you that again. Like, do they have Honestly, attention? I kind of think he's like flying under the radar because he goes to Montessori school and he can like set his own work things. And well, if he's, if he's able to choose yeah. what he's interested in and he likes yeah. school, then ADHD is not necessarily going to show up in school. Yeah. Like I, I was a really good student even having ADHD because I really, really like school. So I found it interesting. So I never had trouble focusing on it because it was interesting to me. So, you know, he may, especially at Montessori where he gets to choose his own work, it may not show up there. But anyways, I was just curious. That's what I, mean. like, I, I actually, after that group call I was on not too long ago, I got the book, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew. Mm-hmm. And it, it feels pretty resonant. And yeah. So I'm I'm still in the first half of the book where they're kind of just going into stories and things like that versus, okay, what can you do about it? And and I choose to know if I would go get testing or not. No, I mean, you don't, the, the benefits to getting tested are that if he needs like an IEP in school, mm-hmm. like as he gets older, if he's not, an IEP is an individualized education plan. So for example, my daughter has an IEP and that gives her, if she needs an extra time to take tests, yeah. it gives her like, she can ask to go move to a quieter place if there's too much commotion in the classroom. And some of those things teachers could just give, they could give accommodations if they mm-hmm. recognize that he needs them, even if he doesn't have an IEP, but a good, I'll say two main benefits to getting an actual assessment and diagnosis. One is to get, to take advantage of accommodations that the school might be able to provide. Another is just to, I mean, and this is something, you know, a lot of people believe the self-identification is, is valid. So I don't know if you need, need it necessarily, or maybe you would want to get it. But for some people, it's not, you know, financially accessible to get an expensive evaluation or there's wait lists at school or whatever, but you could proceed as if. But what I was going to say is it changes a lot of people's attitudes towards your child. If they see him 
as challenging instead of just like, oh, you know, he's doing the best he can. It's hard for him to focus because he has ADHD. So how can we support him rather than just thinking he's being difficult on purpose? Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm working on figuring out how to, how do I build systems so that these things are more effortless versus I, I'm the reminder system. And that book actually kind of seems like the parents are the backbone of Yeah, the I was going to say, I don't know. Sure. I don't know what we'll be able to do that will, yeah. that it, it I mean, as kids get older they're, and their brains mature, I mean, that's a big part of it right now. Like your expectations for him as almost nine, maybe you adjust those down a little bit and it doesn't feel like the support is is out of whack that you're giving him, right? I mean, what they say is yeah, like Yeah, what years. really tipped me off to like, oh, maybe Peter has something is that we had my partner's uh, or my boyfriend's niece and or his, his sister, her husband and two kids lived with us for about four months this summer. And here was a little five-year-old who woke up in the morning, fed all of Peter's animals. I mean, she just, she was so responsible. I mean, she's little miss, you know, and, but I was like, oh, this is possible. This, she's five. And I'm having to be like, Peter, you know, like their striped child doesn't have any water. Like what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, we've got an agreement. I know that you want to do this. You know, do I have to stand over you while you do it? We've been doing it for a long time. And just, it it just made me realize like, yeah, the contrast. Yeah. And and parents often see that if they have more than one child, they'll often see like, oh, my four-year-old can follow a three-step direction. And my, you know, eight-year-old can't follow a three-step direction. Mm-hmm. They, they need help with each step. So, I mean, some of this might just be mindset again for you. Like, you know, right. maybe yeah. recognizing that this is something you're working towards, but it might not be totally possible yet for him to have that independence. And also finding the things that he is more intrinsically motivated to have independence about. And maybe we could talk about that for a second. Like, are there things that you notice that he does have a lot of sort of, you know, being able to follow through with things that, that are not maybe the getting ready for school in the morning? Yeah, I would say like, he's been hand drawing these Pokemon cards and coloring them in making the cards like any, anything that's like his project, he, he gets hyper focused on and yeah. we'll just, he just that's like this morning, he didn't eat his breakfast. And I was like, he's like, No, I'm not eating. I'm working on this. I'm like, babe, it's 805. Like, it's just time to eat breakfast. Yeah. Like we, we need to leave. This is, I, I, I love you. I love that you're doing this. It's time to eat breakfast. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. and hyper-focus is another ADHD thing, right? It's not, because sometimes mm-hmm. they'll suggest to parents, was, maybe you might want to look at ADHD and they're like, but he can focus fine on this other stuff. I'm like, yeah, the things that he's really interested in, yeah. he can yeah. focus fine on. So, <laughs> but this should make you feel better because you do know that he has the capability to follow through with things. It's not like he's just laying around all the time and never gets anything done or falls through on stuff, right? What I find helpful with kids with ADHD in terms of that, you know, doing like the morning routines, let's just use that as an example, Yeah, is what can you give him, what can, what little rewards can you give him for after he's done things? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't mean rewards like here's a sticker or a piece of candy, but like, what can you give him? Okay. So say for an adult who really doesn't want to do the dishes, but then they're like, after I do the dishes, I'm going to sit down and have a nice cup of tea and read my magazine. Hello. Like that's an example that I use for myself, (laughs) you know? So how can you give yourself something that you want after you do something that you don't want to do? And so for a kid, maybe that looks like as soon as you get your shoes on, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll look at these Pokemon cards together or we'll read a chapter of your book or, you know, giving him something to focus on so that he moves through the part that he's not so interested in. Yeah, we have done that a lot. Or it was was kind of just a rule versus a reward was like, we don't get to draw, do Pokemon or whatever until we've done like these four things. Mm -hmm. That's great. How's it work? Having a rediscussion because that does work because he, but it kind of feels like I have to bribe him to get him to do any, like it, that feels a little bit like a bribe to me. Well, like, but am I bribing myself with tea that. and a magazine to do the dishes? Kinda, I mean, yeah. I guess kind of, but you know, it's, it's sort of like a when then. It's a delayed reward. Yeah. yeah. Like when I, when I finish the dishes, then I will sit down and have a, a yeah. relaxing 15 minute break. It's the understanding in him, like we need to do what we need to do. And then we, then we get to do the, the fun things. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I think it's coming back from Thanksgiving and getting back into into our flow there would be helpful. Before bed, 
is a little different because all you get after you do the things that you to get ready for bed is is you get in bed. <laughs> well, but then maybe there's a you know ten minutes of special time with you doing something in bed. Yeah. You know, That's like sweet. you tell them stories we or read. we read every night. Yeah. Together, so. Yeah. And I, I still stay with them. That's another thing I think that I saw read in the book was ADHD that I didn't know about, but not being able to fall asleep without 100%. someone there. Yeah. Like, or, yeah. Or my yes. daughter listens to audiobooks to fall asleep, mm -hmm. but ADHD kids slash people do generally have a harder time falling asleep than other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, with all we went through, if that's if that's what we end up with, it's it's that's a full win, I think. Well, I mean, you could you could experiment with like letting him listen to some music or something if you don't want to still stay. I mean, there's nothing wrong yeah. with staying until he falls asleep. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I do but, that most nights, and but certain nights, I I need to go finish something. I have work to do. I have a you know an online meeting or something that's late, and so then I'll I'll check on him you know, a bunch of times. And so then he's okay with that. Yeah. I used to do that with my daughter too. I'll check on you in five or 10 minutes. And, you know, I think that's really great. So it sounds like you're already doing, I mean, okay. It sounds like when you remember to give him something to work towards and you help get, you scaffold him by helping him stay on task, you're fairly successful at getting things done that need doing. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like the missing piece might be the mindset shift that he should be able to do all this by himself. And maybe that's yeah. just not possible right now yeah. at, at almost nine. Maybe he still needs a lot of help. Yeah. I think you had said, and in, in I think the book did too. It's like the brain development is he's his, it's like three years behind as yeah. far as executive functioning goes. Yeah. That was really eye opening to me. It, it definitely made me be like, Oh, I'm having unrealistic expectations yeah. and I'm making him wrong for this. Instead of being like, wow, he's doing this well and this well and this well, I'm just focused on what's not going mm -hmm. well, which is just making me have anxiety or, or feel, you know, like, well, come on. Or, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think that when you have like a picture in your head of what he should be able to do or what he should do and it's not matching, that's where, that's like the recipe for frustration, right? And yeah, worry. He's been like so competent in other things. It's like, okay, well, you can do this and this, so why not this? But it's yeah. really like you're saying in those areas that are interesting or he's self-motivated for versus what's just kind of part of daily life. Yeah. yeah. What the psychologist told us when, when Maxine got diagnosed, which by the way, she's fine with me talking about. She is very, she actually is quite proud. Is that, maybe that's too strong of a word, but she really, ident she, she feels good about herself having ADHD. She recognizes the gifts of it in a lot of ways. Anyhow, she, what the psychologist told us was that kids with ADHD know the right thing to do. It, they just can't make themselves do it. Yeah. So he yeah. knows he's supposed to be putting his shoes on, but oh, that Rubik's Cube is just so much more interesting. Yeah, it is. I don't blame him. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that I would love to hear if you have any ideas on is I would love to just hear more about his day or hear more about what he cares about or mm -hmm. you know, just stories from his life from when I'm not there. Is there any way to get an almost nine-year-old boy to open up a little bit more instead of say nothing. nothing. <laughs> Let's let me come, come back to that in one second. Cause I just wanted, you mentioned that taking care of the animals. I think one thing that they talk about that, that Sharon Celine talks about in that book, the, what your ADHD child wishes you knew is doing like visual representations of, of like routines and chores. So like, do you have like a visual card of the things that he needs to do to take care of the animals? I've thought about making it for about a year now. So maybe after this call, I'll just sit and, and make it with, yeah. uh, with like, you know, yeah, I, I'll just, I'll just do it. I and mean, then, maybe you can do it together yeah. and it can be like Pokemon themed and you can have, yeah. you know, some cool like visual checklist of the things that need to happen with his animals. And then what I would suggest is using that in conjunction with the, like, because we do want to move him towards like, we don't, you know, I'm not saying we, we take charge of our child's child with ADHD's routine forever. So we want to move yeah. them towards like as you said creating that like muscle memory of of habits and good routines of taking care of ourselves. His but dad's perspective was just let him crash, just let his room get crazy messy, let his animals die, let him fail in school and yeah, then I don't he'll agree learn. with that. That he would learn from that is I'm a failure. <laughs> and I was like, well, I think that might create yeah, bigger problems about identity or about mm -hmm. Oh, my mom was never there for me or just, I was kind of, I was like, okay, all right. And then I was like, actually, no, I, th I think we just, you know, we just 
I just support him as, as long as I'm can and I'm able to. Yeah. And then he's, he'll start modeling at a certain point, right? Like, well, I think, I think part of it, I think there are things, times where we want to let kids quote fail, but not like everything all at once and without, and we're just washing our hands of it. Like, you know, in the self-driven trial, they talk about, I love you too much to fight about homework. And I was talking to a girlfriend of mine when I first read that book a couple of years ago and, and she was like, oh, well, you know, my parents just didn't care at all about my homework and it was all on me. And, and I said, well, wait a second, it's not the choice between two extremes. You know, you're either making sure your child gets their homework done or you don't care at all. It's that you are supporting your child to make them be the one that's in charge, but you're there to help if they need help. So it's like, I talk about this with teenagers you know, in, in bike races, like the Tour de France, it's like the cyclists are riding, but they've got like their support, support, bit, blah, support van with like mm-hmm. the, you know, the snacks and the, you know, extra tubes if they get a flat and their water and their extra jerseys. And the support van is like going along behind the cyclist, but the cyclist is actually the one that's, that's riding in the race and doing all the work. So that's sort of how I would love for you to think of yourself with Peter is like, I'm here for like the backup support and to help him, but he's the one that's got to sort of take charge of the situations. So, you know, and and just one other thing that when you said what his dad said, that made me think of Alfie Cohn talks about natural consequences. And so a natural consequence would be, you know, if you didn't say anything about the animals and they died that, you know, maybe that would be a natural consequence, pretty big one that we, we might not want to, we don't want to let happen. But what he says is what kids, we have to be careful with natural consequences because what kids might learn from them is my parent could have helped me, but didn't, which is sort of what I think you were getting to that you want to, you want him to know he can count on you. And so it's that balance between like, okay, you're, you're in the support van, you're not cycling for him. You're not taking complete charge of him and all of his routines with his animals. However, you are helping him come up with a system, you know, and Seth, Seth Perler might be a good person for you to look up. He's, he was on the podcast and he's an executive function coach. And he has lots of YouTube videos where he talks about helping kids develop systems for executive Mm -hmm. function support. But so getting back to like the card, so it might be you who's, who gets the card out and says, okay, which of these things have you done today? Like, where are you on this card? And then he says, well, I've done this, but not this or whatever. And you say, okay, go do that. And then bring the card back to me. We'll look at the next thing, right? And then you, if you, if he disappears for longer than you think it would take to do get the, the water or whatever, hey, buddy, how are you doing on that task, right? Because a famous thing for people with ADHD is they get distracted by side quests, which is what I, I love that term for it, side quest. Like he might have been on a quest to get the water, but then he notices this other thing in his room and goes on a side quest about something else. So you can be like helping him you know, stay on, but, but he's, he's got the little printable thing that he's looking at. I had this idea that if we get these systems in and we just keep doing them and, you know, honestly, I'm not the most routine person, thank goodness for my partner, because he really keeps like bedtime consistent and this consistent, those things. But it's, I, I have this like fantasy that he like if we do them, you know, over 40 days or something, he'll just start to kind of do them. Maybe years, not days. A little delusional. Okay. Well, I think years, I think (laughs) months or years is a little bit uh, more reasonable than days. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it might be, it might be years, not, not days, but, or somewhere in between, but I think 40 days way too short to think about. That too is like he, he leaves, you know, every little bit, you know, every break and summer break to go up to his dad's in New York. And so then it's almost, yeah, it's just, there's always this like reintegration or the systems, Mm -hmm. things like that. But Mm -hmm you know, that's, that's just how it is. So yeah. So I mean, you're I I love that you're thinking of helping him develop systems. And it's just going to be on you until he's getting older to help him stay on track with the systems. Okay. So okay, so just back to your thing about how do you get a nine year old boy to talk about his day? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I mean, it's pretty typical that kids are in the moment. And like, why would I want to talk about school when I'm at home? And I've got my mom and my animals and my Rubik's cubes and my Pokemon cards. Why would I want to talk about school? So don't, don't feel like, you know, oh, we must not be that connected or, you know, he doesn't want to talk to me about yeah, things or anything. That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, oh, well, how does this go in the teen years? Like if he doesn't, you know, share things, then is, is he going to like float away and we won't be close? Well, or, yeah. But also stop and think, I bet he does share things, but just not when you're asking him, like, how was your day? 
Yeah. Like, think about that for a second. He'll, he'll share them when they relate to something that would be like, oh, oh, we, we did that. Or we had yeah. the B person come to our class or, you know. Some, yeah. yeah. So I think he's just in the moment. And when you are asking him things, that's not when he's thinking about what he did that day. Um, if you, I mean, there is also such a thing as better questions. Um, so if you know that he, something specific is happening at school, like they have like a, you know, I don't know, a particular lesson or someone coming in, ask, like, tell me about when Mrs. So-and-so gave you that lesson today, you know, something that's a terrible example, but do you know what I mean? Like, instead of a general open-ended question, ask him, you know, was your friend Ryan at school today? Did you play with him at recess? Like, you know, asking specific questions and that might help. Yeah. I'll try that a little bit more. Sometimes I do that, but he he just, has these little Mr. Cool answers and I'm like, but mommy wants to know. Well, I, I used to say to I remember my kid when he was in, he was in Montessori kindergarten and I'd say, how was school? Or I said, I would say, what did you do at school? And he would say nothing. And I yeah. said, so did you just sit and stare at the walls? He was like, yep. Uh, I mean, and he, he was not <laughs> wanting to be on my agenda of like when we were going to talk about it, but he told me other stuff plenty of times. Yeah. Okay. I'll reflect more on that might try like a, a routine like maybe with your partner if you all eat you know eat a meal together where mm-hmm. you talk about like I know some clients do this thing called rosebud and thorn rosebud and thorn yeah yeah, yeah. so something like that like mm-hmm. I mean best thing about your day worst thing about your day or I've heard other people say things like did you help someone today or mm-hmm. you know just different maybe you have just a routine of things that you talk about at at a time when you're all together and that might help too for him to come up with some more things to talk about. Yeah, that sounds good. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll catch up and we're taping this before the holidays. So we're going to catch up in the new year in about a month, a month and a bit and see how things are for you. Then. Okay, great. I'm going to sit down with Peter and we'll co-create some systems and then we'll, we'll go for it. That yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it, I mean, when you said you, it's hard for you also you know, sometimes it's also okay to just go with the flow and not fight against your, I mean, I'm not saying don't do the systems, but also sometimes it's okay to just be a little bit more free flowing with life. Yeah. Yeah. Work with that. I think right now would help Peter more if I could be a little more consistent on supporting him with that for Mm -hmm. a while. And then, you know, yeah, like be gentle on everyone if we forget one day or something, Mm -hmm. but I do think it would be good to kind of get those more visual systems and then support him paying attention to them. Yeah. Uh, and be like like the the van or the implementer. Yeah. So he he can be proud of himself too cuz he he I th- I think he would overall just feel better too and more at home in himself and more capable. Those things. Yeah. Well, and don't forget that to that he does get a sense of mastery from everything that he does that is that he's doing because he wants to do it. Right. Yeah. In the self-driven child, they talk a lot about the brain development that comes from kids having a passion, um, mm-hmm. even if it's not like the passion of something we think that they should have passion about, you know, and and typically parents always want kids to like have passion about their homework or about things that have to do with school. But yeah. they they're developing the brain pathways for working hard at something that's important to them that then can be transferred to other things as they get older. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So. There aren't many eight or nine year olds that think school is like really important and he might not even see that until he's much older, like even in high school. But right now through doing his drawing his cards and really learning everything that he knows about all the different guys and their, you know, I don't, they have points or skills or something, right? Like, isn't there some like trivia that goes along with like each character? Yeah. They yeah. Like evolve. There's, there's, it's, it's very complex. So, so yeah. yeah. So him learning all of that stuff. Yeah, and all that stuff. Like, exactly. Yeah. Him learning all that stuff about Pokemon, yeah. he is setting up his brain to be a learner, right? Mm-hmm. And to have like this complicated thing that he's working out. And and when he's interested in applying that to something else, all that brain development will be there. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about wanting him to feel good and have a sense of mastery, he he's already getting that just from some other things that may seem like, it may seem because it comes easy to him, it's not as important, but yeah. it's just as important in the brain development. Awesome. Yeah. I, I love feeling that perspective and yeah, seeing that positive from what he's passionate about. It's yeah. Great. So trust the process. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Sarah. This has been really enlightening. And I just 
I mean, you absolutely, I say, I mean, yeah, I mean, just the turnaround that I saw in my child over those years and the ways that I was able to learn and grow and support him and just become a better human overall or a more loving human and a more authentic human were really powerful. Oh, thanks, Sophie. Hey, Sophie, welcome back to the podcast. It's so great to be here, Sarah. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. So it's been uh, a bit over a month, a month and a bit since we talked last. And I know that Peter was away for a couple of weeks with his other parent. So, but you said we we made, we actually pushed the date a little bit so you'd have more time to sort of work on some of the things we talked about. So let's get an, uh, let's get a bit of an update on some of the stuff we talked about before. I, I know I, just before we hit record, I reviewed with you because this has been so such a while, the things we talked about were sort of changing your mindset around expectations for him and his, you know, independence, create and creating some systems or reminders to help him stay on task more, and also giving him some incentives to, you know, incentives such as not like you know money or anything, but like get, you know we'll have extra time to spend together, or you'll have more time to play, or you know stuff like that. So why don't you give us just a little bit of update in that area? Yeah, great. So mindset, I did really well before Christmas break. And then after Christmas break, I, well, I was trying to multitask too much, you know, instead of just pause and go, just stand there and just sort of, you know, support him knowing I'm there. And so I'm, I'm so glad of this reminder too, because I, I did it even just yesterday going, oh gosh, I went into that pattern again. That's okay. I can I can start again tomorrow. So, yeah, to all the moms out there who <laughs> you know, have that time, but I am very proud of him. We recently last weekend had to go to Atlanta. To, my mom's house flooded, and oh, we had no. to go help out, and it was like slightly traumatic and hard, and just you know, my mom's crying. <laughs> I mean, it was just like very complicated. And Peter was so sweet and helpful. And he had to stay with my sister, who's also a client of Sarah's and her four kids pretty much didn't see me while I was kind of like the muscle to help my mom, you know, get stuff out and everything. And my sister said to me afterwards, she was like, Peter is just the best. He's, he's so helpful, you know, everything. So it's, it's just interesting that he's like, he seems to be like really responsive, you know, to anyone to or, or to others but mom. So I'm super grateful for that. And I'm, yeah, I mean, really grateful for that, just especially with that circumstance. It's go Peter. <laughs> I always think it's a good, like when, when we, even when we feel challenged a little bit by our kids' behavior at home, when we hear other, like I often will ask clients, like, well, what kind of reports do you get from teachers, from like parents, you know, friends of parents of friends relatives and they're like oh they always say you know such wonderful things I'm like okay you know remember that when things are hard it's not you know sometimes we see the most challenging behavior right but when our kids are out in the world they're like really these fantastic wonderful human beings that people say great things about yeah I I agree I think I think Peter's very smart. And I think we do have a special relationship with separating from his dad, who we're on great terms now. I mean, such a miracle. And so I think for all that Peter's been through, the way that he can show up now is is really amazing. So, mm-hmm. Okay. So the mindset piece, this is a good reminder for you to get back to trying to find more patience, that he's not like, you know, dragging his feet on purpose, that yeah. it, it could be you know, we don't know if he has ADHD, but it could be that kind of focus challenge that he has sometimes, like whether it's ADHD or he's maybe just a little bit behind in in the, the focus that a typical nine-year-old might have for things that they don't want to do. We don't know, but that you you are going to get back on track with that mindset piece. Yeah, absolutely. I am. All right. <laughs> The incentives has worked well, or like once you've done X, yes. you know, then you can Y. <laughs> like, okay, you want to look at your Pokemon cards, you want to, you know, FaceTime your dad or whatever. Are your shoes on? Do you have a snack in your bag? Like, perfect. You know, are you dressed? Perfect. That seems to work when he has some sort of inner motivation. Yeah. You know, have you fed your animals? Peter has a couple of reptiles, and that has been the the best way to do it. And well, we talked this morning, we both woke up pretty early and we had a little chat because I knew I was going on the podcast today about, because he 
anyway, he, he does seem to, without me harping on him, it's not, it's just not in his natural way to sort of take care of things, you know, I was, I, which is why we're having a conversation. <laughs> and I was like, you know, cause we did, we did some little drawings and put them on the wall, but I mean, whatever, you know, he seems pretty oblivious of his space. I was like, how can we like help you? I mean, he didn't have any ideas, but it was, you know, we've talked about it for, a, for about a year, <laughs> really actually probably more like four years, but, <laughs> or just like, you know, even to brush his teeth or like, what do we do before bed? Or we put on our pajamas or like, you know, these things. And so I don't know. I mean, he didn't have any ideas, but he just was like, I don't know, mom. <laughs> <laughs> he might just need okay, more. <laughs> he, he might just need more scaffolding from you. And that just might yeah. be, it just might be something that you have to come to terms with that, that you're uh, going to like, you know, and, and maybe I have no idea how long reptiles live, but maybe, you know, after you don't have any pets anymore, you might think, yeah, I'm not willing to do that. Like, I'm not willing to be the one, like, if we're going to get pets, I have to, unless something drastic changes with, with Peter, I'm, I could have to go into this knowing that even if he has the best intentions and says, he's going to do all the care, it will probably be me. Like, so you get to decide, you know, is that something I'm willing to do? Because he leaves for summer and leaves for Christmas break and leaves for all the breaks. So then I do take care of them, you Mm -hmm. know, full time. So then it's, he's going to like, ah, man, you know, they're going to (laughs) live. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess it just kind of like, we want to match our match reality and our expectations. (laughs) <laughs> but it's not like as a kid, he's like, oh, these are my animals. I'm going to do, you know, he's like, oh, mom just does it like when I'm not, around. you know what I mean? <laughs> Which is okay. But I think that can be part of the mindset shift too. Well, and, and, and you don't have to just do it. I'm not saying you have to do it by yourself, but when he's there, but just know that it's, it is going to take reminding, yeah. right? It is going to take you being in charge of making sure that he does it that he's not going to magically wake up one day and like all of a sudden you're not going to have to remind him to take care of the reptiles or clean it's like, our cages. The main thing is to get out of the power struggle. So I'm not the bad guy that he has animals to take care of, you know, mm-hmm. or like a turtle tank to clean or like, mm-hmm. yeah. Versus like, okay, let's like, let's keep this fun. Let's keep this part that strengthens our relationship instead of just like wears us down and tears us down. That well, have you had a conversation happen. about whether he wants to keep them? Um, we have, we actually got rid of some of them because he was like, mom, this is too much. And I was like, okay, yeah, let's, or I, I was scared to ask him. I was like, honey, cause we, he actually got written up in our local paper because he had nine reptiles <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we let three of them go and which was great. And then a friend took one and anyway, so anyway, we downsized much. So now we, we actually, he only has three now and Anyway, it, it's very manageable. I think it's manageable now mm-hmm, for a night mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. you can really, but I, I do have a praise report that he cleaned his room by himself. I think for the first time yesterday. Wow. Ever. <laughs> just on his own. He just decided he wanted to clean up his room. No, my fiance asked him to, and it was again, an incentive, you know, you can use the iPad when you clean your room. And I think he did check on him like twice, but he actually did it. Good um, for him. And I was like, wow, way to go, Peter. <laughs> well, some of those executive function skills might be starting to come online, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Because that cleaning a room, actually, there are adults it's hard for. that They get bogged down by the little details and the minutia and, and find it hard to, you know, line up the tasks that need to happen. So that's great that he could do that. Honestly, that is the anxiety for me because... There are members of my family, my dear mother with her flooded house, who would say herself probably that the executive functioning prioritization, I mean, we, she and I, that's why I flew out there to help is like, it's just not there. And so what seems like simple to me is like a mountain to her. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think I have like anxiety, like, right. oh gosh, if Peter can't do this, then like, oh, you, I don't know. And That's but, such, that's so insightful, Sophie, because that is a trick. That's like a trigger. It sounds like that you're, you know, fear that he's yeah. never going to get it together as is sounds like rooted in your history and present. Yeah. So, so two yeah. things about that. One is I would just remind yourself, this is a, this is uh, a fear that I have, and it doesn't mean that it's actually going to happen. <laughs> um, give yourself some compassion. And the other thing is, is that you can teach him systems. Like there, you know, if we're specifically talking about like room cleaning, 
One resource I love is there's a woman called Casey Davis, and she has a book called How to Keep House While Drowning. I haven't actually read her book, but I listened to her podcast and I've heard her talk about, she has all these systems for herself. Like she does, for example, every night she does a reset of her kitchen, which doesn't mean she cleans the whole kitchen, but she just, she does a few small things that kind of get ready for the next morning. Like she builds in these, just these habits. And one thing I heard her say was that people get like tasks confused and that's why they get overwhelmed. Like they, I might not be remembering this exactly right, but like to clean a room, there's like, there's that like tidying things up is one part of it. Getting rid of things is another part. Actually cleaning is another part. And if you look at it all at once, it feels like a mountain and totally uh, undoable, right? But if you teach Peter things like, okay, first pick up all the clothes and, you know, decide which ones are clean and which ones are dirty. Okay. Next thing, pick up all the books. Like if you can do systems like that, I don't know what exactly would work for him, but I think you can you know, at nine, teach him systems that will make it so that when he's 29 or 39, he's not going to be living in chaos. Yeah, I had, I grew up in chaos. My mom is a hoarder pretty much. And I had to learn those systems and I'm still learning them at 36. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I I first really started putting them into play at 24. I would Mm -hmm. say I was just really messy and disorganized. And then I started getting systems, which is why I really uphold them and it takes discipline and it's, it really gives back to you though, to have that system or just that, that habit in place. I've been studying habits recently too, and that's mm-hmm. been helpful also. Well, I mean, I don't know if this, this might make you feel better. Just that, you know, the hoarding thing, I actually learned this on Casey Davis's podcast that she was saying, she thinks that hoarding shouldn't be a, a, a diagnosis in itself, that it should be put to, under a trauma. Like it's mm-hmm. actually just a symptom of trauma. So if Peter's growing up without that trauma that your mom may have experienced, he's probably not going to turn into a hoarder. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I thought about that a lot cleaning out my mom's this weekend about what the, because I have a psych degree, but anyway, I was just thinking about what, what is hoarding about? What is this? Like, this is so, ah, there's stuff that's so old here or so useless <laughs> yeah, apparently it's a trauma response right yeah so yeah. and that makes a lot of sense to me when, when yeah I think she about had it. A lot of trauma so shout out to my mom love you very much you yeah great mom. <laughs> okay so you had mentioned that before before we go I mean I thank you for the updates it sounds like you are on a good path to feeling at least a little bit more peaceful about some of the challenges with Peter then even if it's not hugely changed, it feels more peaceful. But it does sound like you mm-hmm. made progress with the incentives thing, like the first then, yeah. then this. So I think that's just good. Yeah. Keep Definitely keep that in your And in another your thing I did was if he has a good attitude, then he does get like a dollar or something like that. So that was money. I hope that's okay. But if he has a good attitude about specifically cleaning the turtle tank, then mm-hmm. then he gets like you know, like $2 or something like that. And so that's helped him because he'll go, good attitude, good attitude. And I'm like, <laughs> that's right, dude. That's what's up. Like, the yeah, high five. <laughs> well, the thing about paying kids for things is that we just always want to make sure that there are some things that they do for that are not for pay as just mm-hmm. part of the family team. And that if that, you know, if you want to do chores like over and above what they're, what they're responsible for as part of the family team for pay, then that's fine. Like, yeah, yeah it's just you know, finding that balance. Quite, quite an endeavor. It does. It is pretty gross. And so I do reward him. That's yeah. like, that's like a paid chore. Like yeah. you did it, dude. Like I get it. It's That's it's great. <laughs> yeah. If that, work, that works for you, then that works. It's not that it's wrong to ever pay kids to do things. It's just that you want to make sure that you have a balance of, yeah. of, you know, unpaid chores because they're part of the family team and then Mm -hmm. things that are, that they can do for pay. I love that. Thank Mm -hmm. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you had mentioned that there was something else that was, that had developed that you wanted to ask me about. Yeah. So now, and I don't know if it's because we, like he came in town and then we went back out of town and, or, or what, but he has started, if he has any sense of like negativity or blame or anything, he is going and hiding under his desk. And it is sort of a new behavior. And I definitely, it's like, I can't find him. And then I'm like, oh, sweetie, you know, so then I've just approached him and been like, you're, can, is there anything you want to say? You can tell me anything. Are you all right? You know? And um, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, he's hiding under his desk. It's a new behavior. And what does he say when you find him? 
he just cried and usually there's either something he wanted that he didn't get that someone put a loving limit on or he thinks that someone thinks that he's bad or something like that. And and is the someone thinking that he's bad like based in any like has he been scolded or corrected or something like Let me think. There was one time that my fiance thought that he didn't brush his teeth, but he did because he didn't turn it on because it's an electric toothbrush. So he didn't, my fiance didn't hear it. Mm -hmm. He does brush his teeth. So, and Miguel just made a face and said, I don't know. And Peter got very upset Mm -hmm. and um, ended up under his desk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, we know he's sensitive. We've already talked about that. He's a sensitive kid. Sensitive kids need very little correction because they are so easily shame prone. Mm-hmm. And so when we do correct sensitive kids, we always have to want to make sure that, and of course we're not going to be perfect. And it's not going to happen every time, but whenever we can think about leading with empathy, like um, trying to think of, uh, it doesn't exactly fit with the toothbrush thing, but you know, if you did have to correct him about something, you always want to try, like say he, knock something over or something like that. You want to say like, Hey, I I don't think you saw that there. Or like saying something that you're acknowledging, like you're still a good person. Yeah. Like open to the possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I can see why you did that. Or I, I still think you're a good person, even though I want to talk to you about this other thing. So that's one thing that just makes sure you're doing that. And it sounds like I don't, I can't think of how Miguel could have done that in that situation. I mean, that sounds like an honest mistake. If you didn't hear the toothbrush, of course you would doubt that a kid had brushed their teeth, right? I explained that both to Miguel and to Peter. Yeah. You know, Miguel, you didn't know that Peter's toothbrush isn't making a sound and Peter, this is why he thought that. Yeah. So that that was okay. But just that that was the immediate response was that sounds like you couldn't have prevented it necessarily, but that it's just a repair that needs to happen afterwards. So maybe you just, you do find him under his desk and you just really work on it. So a couple things are coming to mind. He's sensitive. He's getting older. There's so much pressure in our culture for boys to not show feelings that Mm -hmm. maybe he's starting to, you know, feel that a little bit more. And so maybe having some conversations about, you know, the actual like strength of showing your feelings Mm -hmm. and, and being one vulnerable and trying to counteract some of that pressure, the toxic masculinity pressure might be helpful. And the other thing is that too, you, you know, he was away from you for a couple of weeks and he's just got gotten back not too long ago. And so there's that transition. And also, you know, you're talking about your fiance, you just got engaged, which is a big, it's a big change for him, even if it's a wonderful change. And even if, you know, Miguel has been in his life and obviously he has, but it's still it's a new label. It's a new chapter. And it's been you and Peter against the world for so long, right? And Mm so I'm, I, even if it's a happy change, it's still an adjustment for him. So I wonder if he's feeling particularly sensitive with these different life changes that are happening. Yeah. He, uh, he seemed to just be like, whatever to we're engaged. (laughs) He didn't have any peers. Yeah. He was just very present with his Pokemon cards when we told him so, which, but I wasn't expecting too much, but I think your point about being able to express his emotions and find somewhere productive to put them instead of go into like survival freeze mode would be really great. Do you have any ways of opening that conversation for a sensitive nine-year-old boy? You just say, you know, I noticed sometimes lately when you've gotten upset, you've gone in and gone under your desk. And I wonder if there's a part of you that, that feels like you shouldn't cry or you shouldn't show your feelings. So yeah. like that, I wonder, like I've noticed this, I wonder this, yeah. and maybe he'll say nothing. Or maybe he'll just say like, no, or whatever. And you can, but then you can just say, well, I just want you to know that even, you know, everyone has to cry sometimes and everyone has strong feelings sometimes. And it's really healthy to express those feelings and tell somebody about them or draw a picture about them. Or, you know, it's really, it's not, it's not good for your heart. You can say your heart, but I don't know why I said that. It's not good for your heart to just keep them all inside. Um, yeah. And that, you know, s- sometimes, yeah, sometimes we want to be alone if we're feeling upset, but we also want to make sure that we are letting people support us. So I think mm, I would just say that I to love him. That. Thank you so um, much, Sarah. And then That's if great. you do find him under his desk again, remind him of that. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's great. You are so welcome. It's been so great to catch up with you. And again, congratulations on your engagement. That's so exciting. And yeah, I know I'll be hearing how things are going in the membership. So I, I won't say like a dramatic goodbye here because I know we'll, we'll still Absolutely. be in touch. 
<laughs> I will be on. Sarah, you're an angel and just, I mean, you've just helped heal so much in my family and for my family and I will be forever grateful. So thanks for bringing me on the podcast. To all those moms out there struggling, uh, you can do it. <laughs> oh, you're so wonderful, Sophie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Sarah. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.